G'day. Now, um, what we're going to look at today are what makes a good survey, a good questionnaire. And that is a very, uh, it's a very difficult thing to do really, really well. Uh, but there's some main considerations that you need to take into account. Now, this beautiful table is uh, provided to us by Judy Burns, a wonderful math teacher. Um, and she basically just summarizes what most of the most good textbooks talk about. And that's good questionnaires have simple language, the questions are unambiguous, in other words, you can't confuse them, they respect privacy, they don't have any entrenched bias, and this is really one that it's quite, uh, quite polemic at the moment, and that the number of choices or the broadness of the questions are, aren't so much that they confuse uh, the people reading, not people doing the survey. Now the example of simple language is, if you say, describe the frequency, the frequency with which, which you consume takeaway food on a weekly basis. You know, that's unnecessarily device, and that you're using words that you don't need to use, but you could just quite simply just say, instead of that, do you eat takeaway food uh, every week or on a weekly basis? You know, that can be rewritten. So this is a poor example. These are all poor examples of, of each feature. Now, unambiguous question is what type of car do you own? Now in this case, do you mean the make of the car, the style of the car, the size of the car? There's plenty of different aspects of it and plenty of different ways that people can take that question. Respect to privacy, if you ask for any personal details, uh, then that's a problem. Okay? You, some people might reject that. In fact, the census, just by keeping the information for just a little bit longer this year, copped a lot of criticism. And a lot of people were, uh, were saying, well, just don't do the census because uh, you can't trust that they're going to keep your data safe. Now, freedom from bias is one of those things that bias is a very, very difficult thing for some people to understand that they have. Now, if you look at what do you think of changing the Australian flag, given that it's part of our history and our soldiers have died for it in the past? By reading that, you actually get the impression that the person reading, the person asking the question really, really is fond of the flag and doesn't want to change it because they're using very emotive language, like our soldiers have died for it and that it's part of our history. A lot of the, By reading that, even if you don't consciously know it, it puts these ideas in your head that make it uh, a poor choice to change the flag because it's, it's difficult. A person who wants to change the flag doesn't necessarily, uh, not doesn't necessarily, but isn't opposed to the fact that, our, that soldiers have died for it. They may be very, very patriotic in that respect, but by using that wording, it gives you a certain opinion. So a really, really good question that's free of bias hides the opinion of the person who wrote the question. That shouldn't come into it. Uh, you could just say, what do you think, or is changing the Australian flag a good or a bad thing? And it doesn't actually give an opinion and embed an opinion with it. This, given that part that it's part of our history and that our soldiers have died, it's too emotional. So consideration of a number of choices it just basically means make your questions small enough so that you can actually answer them. If you ask, how well did you enjoy your meal? It's very open-ended. You can enjoy different parts of the meal more than others. By providing, was the meal sweet? Was the meal uh, sour? Uh, did you enjoy the first course of the meal, uh, or the presentation of the first course of the meal? There are plenty of different ways you can actually organise that question to make it more specific. Okay? The question may have so many different answers. Uh, so either make the question very specific or provide a list of answers to choose from. And so what you'll often see is a bunch of different answers, good, not good, and you'll have to tick or choose one of the options. So taking into account all of that, when you design a questionnaire, you need to decide what information you want to gather. And then you want to carefully word each question to ensure that you collect the data that you've decided. If your questions are a little bit off, you might actually end up collecting data that you don't want or data that's not relevant to actually what you're trying to find. Now, 
step three, which wasn't mentioned earlier, is you need to select an appropriate format for each answer. Is it open-ended? Is it going to be words or sentences? Are they going to be tick boxes or even a scale? Finally, you can trial your questionnaire with a few people, and if it doesn't meet your expectations, you can try again. But really, it's the question types, the questions themselves, that's the, uh, the real art of designing a good questionnaire.